And it's funny how some memories that are gone just reappear. Like the smell of your skin and the way you wore your hair. But time just goes away. And we never get a chance to say. Circles on the trunk going round. And every acorn that fell past the tire swing into the clay. Was a soft prayer whispered that the oak tree will always remain. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Hope everyone's had a wonderful day and has stayed dry uh, for most of it, and everyone's cars are safely on higher ground. Um, so, all that's good to hear. Um, welcome to the Great Hall for those in the room and for those joining us online as well. We're happy to have you with us. Um, tonight, we have three wonderful uh, faculty members who will be reading, and I don't want to take any more of the time away from that, so I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Crawford uh, to begin our evening. Hi. I have the anxious honor of introducing the luminous Meredith McCarroll. Anxious because I've never done this before, and I want very much to do what Sarah Kate talked about last night, give an, an introduction that made a beautiful nest for the writer to rest in. Meredith was born and raised in Waynesville, North Carolina. She graduated from Appalachian State University, got a master's from Simmons College, a PhD from University of Tennessee. She is director of writing and rhetoric at Bowdoin College in Portland, Maine. She's also been an instructor at West Virginia Wesleyan Low Residency MFA, directed by Doug Van Gundy, who's here. Meredith is the author of Unwhite Appalachia, Race and Film. Um, Appal Unwhite Appalachia, Race and Film, punctuation counts, and co-editor of that prodigious J.D. Vance spanking machine that is <laughs> Appalachian Reckoning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, region responds to hillbilly elegy. It is a collection of essays, poems, and art that pushes back against the presumption that any one person is entitled to speak for a culture, especially one as rich, diverse, and complicated as Appalachia. Her book amplifies many voices and was a 2020 American Book Award winner and the Weatherford Award winner for nonfiction. It is a great joy to Meredith that there are contributors to this important work right here in this room. Can you please raise your hand if you contributed to Appalachian Reckoning? Yeah. Well done, you. 
Meredith's first, first publication came about in the second grade when she won a writing award for her story about a rabbit who thought he was a squirrel, which was published in the town newspaper. Ghost written by her pa, Meredith is haunted by guilt that he has gone uncredited until, <laughs> <laughs> until this evening. <laughs> she suddenly thinks this first publication experience is what gave her a keen appetite for collaborative, fully credited work. <laughs> Currently, Meredith is working on a book-length project about claims to ancestry and place, from which she will be sharing tonight. Meredith's essays have appeared in Southern Cultures, Bitter Southerner, avidly, among other places, such as Still, the journal. This is from the start of Rolodex, an essay published there. I keep wanting to call you to tell you that you died. Some days I forget the sound of your voice. Once already, I couldn't remember your eyes. 15,347 days. That's how many days I got to live in this world with you, Mom. I have lived without you now for 319 days. At night lately, I Rolodex through times together to grab a moment and pin it down. And that's what Meredith does and what she helps others to do, pin it down. In answer to her own writing prompt in her creative nonfiction class, she wrote, what keeps me moving is the desire to capture the voices and stories of those who shaped me. I am blessed to be in her class this week where I have witnessed her ability to inspire her students through deep listening, compassion, and well-placed questions that help clear the mist covering what's at the heart of their own stories. It is a tremendous superpower. If she could have another, it would be time travel. Let us welcome Meredith McCarroll. Hello. Thank you so much, Lauren. You did an amazing job and set a very high bar. It's so wonderful to be here at Heinemann. I've been hearing about Heinemann for a really long time, and it actually um, is even better than I dreamt it could be. It's really rare to be in a place where you can snap green beans, and you can sit down on one end of a porch and s listen to a slow story. You can walk over to another porch and hear fiddle music. You can get a tarot reading, I hope tonight. And you can also just spend hours talking about words. It's been wonderful. And thanks to all of the people who are making me feel so welcome um, in my first time at Heinemann in person. So I am going to read tonight from a work in progress. It's very new. Of course, I'm not nervous at all. I feel very confident. Um, <laughs> This is a messy, braided piece that uses critical race theory to consider the myth of native ancestry that works to remember my mom and that questions what home can be. So I'm going to read a little bit from the introduction that lays, lays out some of these threads. Native. A painting hung above my granny's favorite blue chair, a portrait of her ancestor high collared shirt, high bun on top of her head, and high cheekbones. Her mother's grandmother, I understood. My Cherokee great-great-grandmother. I know, you've got one too. Everyone has a Cherokee ancestor that they cling to. <laughs> I get it. I grew up in Western North Carolina, close to the Kuala Boundary, the home to the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, and I never mistook that I was kin to my friends who were Cherokee. The story stuck, though. The idea that I'm magically part Cherokee is overplayed, and I'm not going there. The story that I heard, always quietly and always from the other room, was that this ancestor was raised by a white family when she was abandoned during the Trail of Tears. So I have spent enough time in and around classrooms studying history and narrative and power to understand all the reasons that I wanted to cling to this connection that put me on the right side of history and made my adoptive ancestors white saviors. It validates my claim to this land and erases all of the complicated feelings about removal that come up when I drive past historic markers for Rutherford Trace on my way out to hike at Pisgah Forest. It was only recently that a friend, a historian who had heard me mention the story parenthetically, suggested that I research it. 
Why had I never tried to track it down, he asked. Finding or not finding some DNA connection won't change who I am and it won't erase the privilege that I've had, I said. But what about her, he asked. You could find out for her sake. At the end of the Revolutionary War, a new boundary was drawn for the Cherokee along the Blue Ridge. In 1793, it was moved to the Pigeon River, quote, opening up land for settlement, as the county website describes it. I imagine that it felt less like an opening up for those who were moved out, though. I imagine that when David Allison was granted 250,000 acres and when Thomas and Robert Love started buying up this land, there might have been questions about those claims. What gives someone the right to claim a place? Can I, seven years a resident of Maine, still call Waynesville home? If I was raised in the North Carolina mountains, can I say I'm a native of the place? Can my kids who spent most weekends here and lived the first 10 years of our family's life close by stake a claim here? When the Allisons and the Loves staked their claim, it was disruptive. One group of people lost their hunting grounds and were forced to move, while another group had room to stretch due to their deeper pockets. What does it mean for my little family casting our votes and schooling our kids in Maine to think of this same spot in North Carolina as home? Three years after we moved to Maine, mom grew too sick to live alone. She had lived with a blood disease, polycythemia rubrovera, for almost two decades, and it was finally taking its toll. On a chilly January morning, I took her out of the same rehab center where her mama, my granny, had died. I flew her to Maine, far from the mountains she knew, but into a family she loved. When mom was at the end of her life, a social worker from hospice asked her what questions lingered for her. What is my legacy, mom asked. This question surprised me simply because I'd never heard her worry in this way. The resolution that day came from a look at my brother and a look at me. Your family's your legacy, the social worker assured her. We all nodded and we felt some resolve, but that question has lingered for me, knowing that my mom had never forgotten her kids, but that there was more in the answer that she wished for something that she didn't quite figure out how to say or ask that was on her mind in those last weeks. Now that she's gone, I return to her house. It's a doll's house with no dolls, frozen in the moment that she left in an ambulance, walls lined with family pictures, closets filled with her clothes. In that house, I become my mom. I know where her gardening gloves are, even though I can never remember where I keep mine in Maine. I go back and I rearrange the silverware drawer after my daughter unloads the dishwasher. I instinctively weed the English ivy that has grown over the ferns planted on the bank. I fill up the bird feeders and watch the tufted titmouse, nuthatch, balding cardinals, and catbirds take their turns at the feeder. I slow down. I breathe in the life that my mom imprinted on this house and in this land. I sleep in my mom's bed, which still has her stack of books on it next to a note from me that I can't bring myself to move. I consider moving it to the drawer in her bedside table, and when I open the drawer, I find notes from grandkids, pictures of my brother's family, a thank you from my sister-in-law, more cards from me. I close the drawer and give myself more time to let her curated bedside table hold residence. Her legacy is the collection of notes in her nightstand, the the jack-in-the-pulpit under the deck, the gin and tonic glasses in the pantry, the Audubon guide beside the sofa looking out at the bird feeders, the knowledge that my family brings with us of how to be still in this house, eating dinner outside, lingering over an extra cup of coffee in the morning, a drink on the porch before we grill the asparagus and toast the bread. Her legacy is the arrangement of rocks that she collected on camping trips out west, a well-seasoned cast iron for frying okra. Her legacy is not entirely visible to me yet, as I mourn her and miss her and keep expecting her to turn the corner. A few years back, Mom took my family to Cherokee. I hadn't been in decades. The road had been widened, and there was no more black bear you could buy a Coke for at the crest of the hill, no Indian in a headdress to pose with for a Polaroid. We bought tickets to Colonel Lufty Indian Village, which has become an educational experience so different than what was around when I was growing up. It all felt somehow more authentic, which made me immediately question my vantage point as a consumer, as an audience member. Who here is actually native, my older son asked, like so many tourists to the region before him, like where are the real Cherokee? 
if I magically trace my bloodline back to this ancestor, I might believe that I had become Cherokee. If I stay for three weeks each summer at my mother's empty home, I might believe that I'm still a North Carolinian. Perhaps my ancestor was Cherokee. Certainly, I was raised in North Carolina. But to slap a North Carolina native bumper sticker on my car or to refer casually to a Cherokee ancestor, is that a lineage that I have the right to claim or to pass along? There's a sense that when we bridge a gap in history, perhaps through research of an ancestor, we ourselves become more complete, that we now have a route to trace back, a deeper way of understanding. As we wandered through the gift shops and learned from blowgun demonstrations that day at Oconalufti, we continually heard and read the phrase living history. So I pointed to dozens of people around us in answer to my son's questions about where the Cherokee were. I explained that they were enacting a past way of living at Oconalufti and that I grew up with several kids who were Cherokee who, like me, ate at Pizza Hut and went to the movies on Friday and shopped at Walmart. As we drove back across the mountain to Waynesville, I wonder if my kids felt more connected to a legacy that they so wanted to believe in, or had it made clear that regardless of who our ancestors had been, we were not Cherokee in any important way. My mom was born and raised in Waynesville, North Carolina. Her father was born and raised in Waynesville, North Carolina. She lived for all but a few of her 71 years there, one decade in the house her parents bought when she was a young girl, and then another five decades in the house she and my father built on the land just up the hill from her parents. She had spent her entire life looking at the same mountains, but they never failed to catch her breath, native that she was to that place. When she died, it broke a line going back five generations in Haywood County. My brother gone, her brother gone, mom gone, me gone. If I walk with my eyes open toward this myth as a myth, I believe I can learn something Perhaps not whether this woman was Cherokee or whether she was found and raised by my ancestors, but that woman, Cherokee or not, has a story. My mom, Phyllis Braswell, has a story. Her mama, Lucille Milner, has a story, and that is my lineage, and I am my mom's legacy. During a recent visit back to Waynesville, back home, we arrived after dark. In the morning, I looked outside to see boundary markers just above the house dividing our property from the six acres of woods long owned by a neighbor, but completely undeveloped my whole life. Zillow quickly told me that the neighbor had sold it to a developer from Massachusetts. A 60-unit apartment building was slated to go in on the steep hill. Half of my childhood stories take place in those woods, which ran along my grandparents' property line one lot over. The swings and trails and forts the fox dens and deer paths, dogs buried there, empty bottles of tequila from high school parties buried there, a memorial and a reservoir. Just as I'm feeling righteous and wronged, looking at maps of my hometown to get a sense of where our property line is, I see a link to another map, a map of Cherokee territories in Western North Carolina. The Rutherford War Trace is marked on this map from 1884. I've heard of the Rutherford Trace and think of it as a road, a way you get to Rutherfordton. I somehow didn't know that it was named after North Carolina General Griffith Rutherford, who led an attack on September 10, 1776, to burn the Cherokee town of Nikwasi. I somehow didn't know that colonists had squatted and refused to leave the Cherokee land. Dragon Canoe, a Cherokee warrior, said, quote, we never thought the white man would come across the mountain, but he has and has settled on Cherokee land. He will not leave us, but a small spot to stand on, end quote. And so I finally learned Dragon Canoe defended his land. Along with other young warriors, Dragon Canoe killed 30 colonists. This catalyzed Rutherford's march from Morganton through the Swannanoa Gap toward Andrews, passing through my hometown of Waynesville, neighboring Silva and Murphy. General Rutherford organized 2,500 men to enslave the Cherokee and burn all that was remaining. The Rutherford Trace, it seemed, removed all traces of the Cherokee at the birth of the United States. And I had lived right on this land, feeling some loose sort of kinship and connection with Cherokee, with absolutely no understanding of the history of this place I love and the people who were displaced. So what follows is my attempt to allow myself to learn about the development of Western North Carolina, not just today by greedy developers, 
but by the broken treaties, the redrawn boundaries, resistance and abuse to those who were in the woods like these long before the ancestors that I can trace. I learned the name of my ancestor and I worked to connect the dots, but I also in the book tell the stories of the women who raised me, whose names I've always known. So the project that unfolds is also, also weaves in these remembrances of my mom, and I'm gonna read a piece next that fits into the book that was first published in Still. I'm gonna read Rolodex. You got a teaser, sometimes you get a tease and you don't get the actual piece, but surprise, you get to hear me read Rolodex. <laughs> Um, and this piece really came out of Heinemann, which is why I wanted to read it. I read as a participant two years ago at Heinemann when it was remote, and Mary Ann Worthington reached out and said, do you want to send something to Still? And so I sent her this, and it got published, so thank you. Um, and for people in my class, this is an example of a piece in second person, you'll notice. This is called Rolodex. I keep wanting to call you to tell you that you died. Some days I forget the sound of your voice. Once already, I couldn't remember your eyes. 15,347 days. That's how many days I got to live in this world with you, Mom. I've lived without you now for 319 days. At night lately, I Rolodex through times together to grab a moment and pin it down. You at Myrtle Beach with a gin and tonic on the mini balcony looking at the sunset. The sound of the ice cubes in the glass you'd only hold with a cocktail napkin. You walking into the living room where the stereo was, flipping the switch with your manicured finger to release Sade, Sade through the house. You on the sofa reading Southern Living, starting always on the last page. You and Allie's mom in their kitchen, newly single, beautiful women, ignoring your daughters as we practiced our tap routine on the slate floor, Lionel Richie dancing on the ceiling, cigarette smoke hovering, thick cable knit sweaters with turtlenecks and pleated jeans and gold shell shaped earrings. To get to these images, I have to push past the curtain of you in those last months. Skinny thighs and soft pants bent at the knee to relieve the pressure on your tailbone. Feet that swelled and shrank and left your skin stretched and dry so that no matter how much jurgens I rubbed in, they thirsted for more. The sound of your dying that I can't describe without cliche. I pushed past those recent and haunting images to remember. You were sick like that for 204 of your 26,095 days. I want the other 25,891, but I sometimes have to walk through your dying to get to your living. Roanoke. We met there one weekend. Your heart was weaker by then, so we drove to the top of Star Mountain when we would have hiked before. We found the perfect restaurant and sat at the bar. We ordered fries and talked with the bartender who made us cocktails that weren't on the menu until the place had closed down. I could look at the mirror behind the bar and see the two of us. That's the snapshot that I pulled back out and glued into the scrapbook I'm building in my mind two nights ago as I fell asleep. Knoxville. You and I lay on my bed. I nurse Jasper, and when he hears your voice, he pulls his head back and grins up at you. You rub his hair as he relatches. His eyes close. I want to reconstruct every meaningless conversation. So we'll do baked potatoes. I can make a salad. I've got that avocado we need to use. We could put that in the salad. Yeah, we've got a loaf of bread. Do you want to make cheese toast? Yeah, we could just do toast. What cheese do we have? We'll have to look. Will I ever talk to anyone about nothing again? Ready for a drink? I hand you two glasses. I get ice while you pour gin. The ice has melted and refrozen, and I use a knife to chip away to get a piece. It's so hard, I say, jabbing. I can't get a hold of it. That's what she said. <laughs> we nod and smile, but don't laugh. You reach for a spoon and stir the drinks after squeezing the lime. You hand me a glass and raise yours. Cheers. Cheers. If I work every night, can you be reconstructed of pulled apart images and one-sided memories? You are a patchwork doll that I hold to me too tight until your stitching comes apart. Your stuffing falls out, and each time I restuff and patch, you're less you. A picture of a picture of a picture. I want you to read how I'm writing about your death. I want to ask you how to parent a 13-year-old. I want you to remind me how to make the dressing. 
I want to call you crying because I can't call you anymore. Instead, I mine for solid moments that I can pull from all the moments that were nothing and everything. Solid moments I can hold and pick up to be with you. When you died, we went through photo albums to make a slideshow for the funeral home. We made a playlist of songs to play for the party. The files were too big, so they edited them down. Marvin Gaye made the list, but Sinead O'Connor didn't. The Tams got cut, but Moldy Peaches made it. We had pictures of you scuba diving, swimming in your dress at your 50th party, and smiling as a young mother with shoulder-length hair. That time, you, Matt, and I took a funny family portrait in the bathroom got cut. So did one of you with all the grandkids that last Thanksgiving. Pared down, edited out, condensed and condensed again. Picture of a picture of a picture. My early memories are all low angle. I'm in bed while you stand in the doorway to tell me good night. You're backlit. You stand 5'9 in the doorway looking into a room at a little girl whose hair you just braided, tucked into a single bed. I'm walking into your bedroom at the farmhouse, eye level to the bedside table. You're stretched out in the warm bed, lifting the covers for me to crawl in. I am reaching up to hold your hand as we walk through the elementary school I'll soon attend. My head comes just to your waist, my hand held up by your soft hand enveloping mine. It took weeks to find a way to remember your hands from before. First, I know how it felt to rub lotion onto your hands without disturbing the scabs that formed. First, I know how your thumb felled you in a strange, solitary, arthritic location. I spent hours to re-remember how it felt to hold your hand as a little girl. The last few months of your life spent in my living room in Maine in a rented hospital bed. When I came to help you get to the bedside toilet, what did you see in me? When I laid beside you and cried that one time, and you told me, let's not cry, were you glad that I learned to stop? When you lost your words and could not focus, did you see Matt and me on either side of you? Did you see Jeff at your feet? Did you hear me read Robert Morgan to you on the day that you died? I saw stillness and vacancy and focused on the task ahead and morphine and cleanliness and did not let myself understand that this was you, my mama, who made salad with every meal and wore makeup to the mailbox and took me outside to see what new had come up in the yard and let my kids sleep in your bed when they visited and fed the birds and grilled squash in the summer and read till the books overflowed all the shelves and now you were dying right here while we watched. I went back to that elementary school when I was 16 to volunteer. I was convinced they had shrunk the water fountains. Even the door handles had been lowered. I'm writing to you dead to keep you alive. I'm frantically pulling files from a computer as it crashes. Most days we talked on the phone about nothing. Quiet would hang there and we'd wallow in it, no rush. I want to call that disconnected number now. You'd ask slowly, well, what's going on? I'd tell you that I'm just not doing as well as I thought I was. I'd tell you how I can't sleep and how I'm trying to remember things that I'm afraid will slip away. You'd say, yeah. You might ask if I'd written it down. You might remind me about when you couldn't see your mama's face, so you looked at pictures and it filled back in. You'd be quiet. You wouldn't fix it. You'd hear me. You'd ask me what I'm making for dinner. Eventually, I'd say I have to go. You never said you had to go. You'd say I love you, and I'd say I love you too. And then on a certain day, you'd say, bye, bye. And together, like the violent fems, we'd say, bye, 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 bye. I'd laugh and say, okay, bye. And put the phone back on the receiver, hit off on the cordless, flip, close the flip phone, hit the red button on my cell phone, bye. You're squatting under the deck when I get off the school bus. I run up the driveway and my jacket's around my waist and my braids have come out and I sprint up as you look down at me. I see you see me. I throw my bag down and you stand up. My head's at your ribs. My arms reach all around your waist. Your arms overlap on my back and we squeeze quick. Then you squat back down and weed. I squat beside you and pull leaves off the flower bed. How's school? Pretty good. Was Miss Walker back today? No, we had another sub. Hands lift leaves, pull unwanted roots. Shh, shh. Get your homework done before we have to get you to dance, okay? 
Okay, I don't have much. Plants emerge, dead leaves pile. There you are, squatting on noisy knees, quiet in the spring sun, hands in the flower bed. There you are, peeling potatoes at the sink, leaning on one hip. There you are, sunglasses and hairspray in a hot pink bathing suit. There you are, glass of wine on the table, asking another question. There you are, there you are, there you are. Thank you. That was awesome. Carter Sickles is author of the novel The Prettiest Star, published by Hub City Press and winner of the 2021 Ohioana Book Award in Fiction, Southern Book Prize, and the Weatherford Award. The Prettiest Star was selected as a Kirkus Best Book of 2020 and a Best LGBT Book of 2020 by O Magazine. That's for Oprah. His debut novel, The Evening Hour, published by Bloomsbury in 2012, an Oregon Book Award finalist and a Lambda Literary Award finalist, was adapted into a feature film shot in Harlan County, Kentucky, and premiered at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival. Carter's the recipient of the 2013 Lambda Literary Emerging Writer Award and earned fellowships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Swanee Writers Conference, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and McDowell. He's Assistant Professor of English at Eastern Kentucky University. Lydia Yuknovich says, The prettiest star is the story of a queer desiring body moving through the crucibles of life toward song, toward rewriting family and whatever we mean by home, toward a kind of hope that comes from the dirt up and not the sky down. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution says of the evening hour, how we heed our conscience in a changing world is one of the questions this book asks. Where do we go to hear it when the places where it speaks to us are being destroyed? Sickle's stunning de debut novel offers an aching glimpse of how to listen. I was reluctant to introduce Carter Sickles, as a high percentage of what I know about him is incriminating, <laughs> both to him and myself. <laughs> we spent many a pandemic night with our partners around a fire, around a card table, and before the pandemic, trawling the hard streets of Park City. Bowling Green, Cincinnati, Harlan, Lexington, New York City, in search of neon truth and Tony cocktails. <laughs> it's been a dream, but one best left to other settings to recount. In the end, I took the job because this seemed a likely crowd to help Carter reach a long standing personal goal. He's really wanting to reclaim his ability to play euchre. <laughs> a card game of his Southern Ohio youth, now forgotten. I have heard him ache for a restoration <laughs> of his euchreability. <laughs> we tried to teach him to play Rook, but Rook, in its similarity to euchre, does not enable memory but only confounds it. <laughs> if you know, truly and deeply know how to play euchre, please contact me <laughs> at Reading's End. I also wanted to say, I was with Carter Sickles at the Sound Bar in Lexington, Kentucky on election night in 2016. We went to celebrate, but were denied I have been with him off and on over the next six years of grief and destruction, the undoing of the well done and the perpetuation of the unspeakable. We have cussed and consoled 
as the humanity of everyone in this country has been jeopardized, where it has not been denied outright. Here in the summer of 2022, the depth of Carter Sickles' bitterness about the current political environment has inspired me to go on. <laughs> Only a person who has not given up could be so righteously angry about the current dysfunction. In the past year, Carter Sickles has been on fire in his essay writing, in particular with Men Playing Men in the Oxford American and Rescued and Cutleaf. Clear-eyed and courageous in his depiction of his transition and exploration of how to navigate these raw and dangerous days. In his commitment to his students, his amplification of silence voices, in the fierce clarity of his thinking and prose, in his commitment to living and learning and celebrating life's possibility, life's abundance, and in his documentation of the rich and varied community of tolerance and love and defiance that exist in this world, Carter charts the path between hard understanding and hope and betters the odds that love and happiness will one day break out on a national and global scale. I am proud to be his friend, and I pray I am his ally. Please welcome him to the Hyman stage. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, um, Robert, so much. It's an, uh, truly an honor to be introduced by Robert Guy, my friend, and who many of you know is pretty famous for his author introductions <laughs> and how they're wonderful and creative. And he's also pretty famous for his beautiful and incredible obituaries. So I am happy I'm only getting the author intro today. <laughs> Um, but it's very, it's a good, so good to be here. And I want to thank Josh and all the staff and, and all of you. It's been um, such an inspiring and nourishing week. And I can't believe we're already um, you know, almost through. But uh, it's just been f such a fantastic time. And I'm really grateful that I was invited back. Um, I've been struggling, as some of you know, <laughs> these past few days about what to read, and I've been intimidated and inspired by um, the, the, the readings, and so many of you have been reading from new work, um, so I felt challenged by that, <laughs> and I'm also going to read new work. Um, this is very new. I don't usually read from work that's this new. Uh, it's a new novel that I'm working on and has not um, had eyes on it. Um, but I also remember that I read from The Prettiest Star here in 2000, I think 16, before it was published. So that also made me feel like I could get this good energy and some good luck from um, Heinemann. So I'll just give you a little setup. Um, so the main character is Nate, and he is a screenwriter. He's living in LA with his husband, Terrence, and he's been estranged from his family for about 15 years. He's transgender, he's a transgender man, and when he transitioned, his father told him not to come back. Uh, his mother died several years ago. And uh, then he gets this call that his father has gone to the hospital, and they are moving him into a sort of rehabilitation center. I'm actually still working out what's kind of wrong with the father. That's how new this is. Um, but he does have some dementia. Um, and then Nate also has a younger brother, um, Cash, who right now is in jail. Um, so I'm just going to read this one scene, which is, I think, the second chapter uh, when Nate returns to Southern Ohio, is where it's set, um, to see his father. And I don't have a good title for the novel yet, <laughs> or none worth sharing, but um, the chapter I'm just calling Things Disappear. The closest airport was in West Virginia, still a 40-minute drive. I planned to stay for five days, enough time to find out what was wrong with my father's health, get his paperwork in order, and then help him get settled back in at his house. I'd clean up the messes and then return to my life in L.A. with Terrence. 
20,000 feet below, the Ohio River snaked through dismal fields, around squat buildings and dots of houses. A wave of nausea lurched through me as the plane seemed to accelerate <clears throat> and then descend drunkenly through a web of gray clouds toward the river. And I clawed my sweaty fingers around the germy armrests, praying to a God I'd rejected to save me. I want to live. I want to go home to L.A. and say yes to my husband. Let's adopt. Let's become daddies. Just don't leave me. Don't. Terrence had wanted to come. Of course he did. We'd sat in our kitchen among the succulents, all the beautiful plants, California sunlight drenching the apartment, bright and unchaotic. Though, I re though I'd resisted it, some part of me knew as soon as I got that co phone call, come, sorry, though I'd resisted it, some part of me knew as soon as I got that phone call at the gym that I would come, have to come back here. I said, if I'm going to do this, I have to go by myself. He just looked at me. But you don't, he said. That's the thing. I knew Terrence genuinely wanted to be here to help. But he also wanted to see for himself this world that I had masterfully excised from our marriage. Terrence fantasized about bringing our parents and families together to fully entwine our lives, but I worried if he caught a glimpse of the truth of where I came from, he would no longer be able to separate me from the dirt of my family. It would be impossible for him to look at me in the same way. The plane touched down without incident. I walked through the quiet terminal and followed a stream of men into the bathroom and waited for a stall to open. Of course, there were no gender neutral or single stall bathrooms in this red state. A line of men stood at the urinals, men in baseball hats, men in cargo shorts and flip flops, men in khakis and drab shoes holding their dicks. I felt fortunate to not be part of such a club, sad club. Nobody here would ever consider that I might not be one of them. Yet years of this life, as queer, as trans, had taught me to keep my eyes down, to make myself small and visible. Then I glanced in the mirror, just another sad, bespeckled, middle-aged white guy. Maybe I was a part of their pathetic club. At the car rental desk, a large man with a goatee and dull eyes tapped away at his keyboard, ignoring me. As I waited, I texted Terrence that I'd arrived. I'm here, I said, in hell. Sir, I need your driver's license, the man said, glaring over his screen. Despite his use of sir, a stuffy masculine word that still sometimes caught me off guard, a residual puff of shame tickled up my spine, my body remembering the many times I was questioned and challenged about my gender, and all the months of filling out paperwork and providing doctor's letters and en endless documentation to underpaid employees, some who treated me kindly and others who smirked or looked away. Passport, driver's license, social security card, everything had to be updated and changed so that I could move through the world, so that I could legally exist. Now I was recognized as a man and all my papers were in order, but still, it's hard to shake that feeling that you don't deserve to be seen. The goatee guy frowned at my California license, but barely glanced at me. I'd been traveling for about 14 hours with two layovers, and I felt exhausted and frayed. As I walked outside under the gray skies, the air cool enough that I needed a jacket, I was stopped by the familiar taste and smell, which I'd forgotten, thick, heavy, and haunting, like some Appalachian murder ballad, memory and loss and hurt and love and violence all tangled around me, embodying me, and for a moment I stood still, overcome, like my mother's experience at church. It's a beautiful feeling, she told me, when you're overcome. It didn't feel beautiful to me. I wish now I'd said yes to Terrence. I didn't know if I could do this alone. But when I got in the economy car and turned on my phone's app map, I felt calmed by the crisp British female voice, the same one that guided me through the Byzantine, tra Byzantine traffic of LA. I knew the general direction of the rehab center, but I relied on the robot to instruct me, omniscient and commanding, the voice of God. I drove slowly into southern Ohio like a timid out-of-towner, not the way I used to, pedal to the meadow with no hairline twist too treacherous, no hill too steep. I thought I was fearless then, but I was just careless, 
My brother drove the same way, as had my cousins and teammates. Driving was our entertainment and power. We had nothing to lose. Now I wanted to look, which was another way of saying I wanted to live. I couldn't stop from taking notes on the landscape that had shown up in some form or another in all my work. Growing up, I had often felt like I was simultaneously two people, the participator and observer. And it wasn't until many years later that I understood this to be a common experience for writers and artists, a deep, tucked away part of the brain constantly turning the living we do into art. I thought about Kat's crazy idea to shoot the film here. There was no way I would let that happen. The last thing I wanted to do was bring these worlds together. But I also noticed a tingling in the back of my neck, a pull towards something just out of reach, a tantalizing promise impossible to see until you go around the bend or climb over the hill. The landscape looked mostly the way I remembered it. It was both expansive, all that new spring green, which tricked you into thinking the place was untouched, pristine, and terribly repressed and antiquated. A sign outside a Baptist church urged sinners to get down on their knees. I couldn't resist and pulled over to snap a picture to send to Terrence or post online. There was the same tired pro-life billboard that had been there since the 80s, the smiling white baby yellowed by years of rain and snow. Plenty of gun and ammo shops. I noticed a few big, newer, big barn-style evangelical churches, one with a sign that said Soldiers for Christ, and a scattering of Trump signs and Blue, Live, Blue Lives Matter flags desecrated the landscape. The president had had one of his terrible rallies not far away, and I wondered if my father or anyone, anyone in my extended family had attended. I could taste and smell all the desperation and rage. I understood at a young age the only way to live, to survive, was to get out. The Rehabilitation Center was located just outside of Clayton, home to the regional state college that I'd attended for three years, two of those years at a basketball scholarship on a basketball scholarship. Because its economy was driven by the student population, the town hadn't fallen into complete disrepair, despair like the rest of the region. When I was growing up, Clayton was where we went for big grocery trips, doctor appointments, and on special occasions to the B&T Steakhouse and Seafood Buffet. My parents had rarely ventured in past my parents had rarely ventured past the outskirts of the university town, which had seemed like another country with its grand red brick and imposing stone buildings. The campus made them feel small and ashamed, and the college students were also to be avoided. According to my parents, they were nothing but hippies and heathens. But whenever we happened to drive through the downtown, I looked around in wonder, enthralled by the students with their long hair and sandals and general ease, lounging outside coffee shops or stretched on, out on the grassy knoll. They seemed to exist in a state of constant freedom. I pulled into the parking lot of the cinder block low-slung building, surrounded by a parking lot and a few strips of grass. It was called a rehabilitation center, but I understood what it was, and so would my father. For a moment, it felt like the car was still moving, a sudden saturation of color and tilting perspective. The buzzing in my ears reeled through me. I told myself to stay as still as possible. This too shall pass. I inhaled and exhaled. After a moment, the racing in my chest quieted and the intensity of the colors faded. I rummaged through my backpack for the tin of gummies, high in CBD with a minuscule amount of THC, and popped one in my mouth. I hesitated, popped another. At the front desk, I told the receptionist, a middle-aged woman with thinning hair and a flat, expressionless face, that I was here to see Duke Collins. Who are you? I'm his son, I said, bracing myself. Because my father had used my old name in his emergency paperwork, I'd come prepared with documentation, including a copy of my legal name change dated from 15 years ago. I expected I'd suffer through many irritating, ignorant conversations about my gender, and I felt amped up, eager for a battle. But the receptionist didn't care who, seemed to care who I was. She picked up the phone and squeezed the bridge of her nose like she'd had a sudden searing headache. He's still in physical therapy. She handed me a stack of papers. Start filling these out. 
I sat in the lobby and filled out the paperwork as best I could, but there was so much I didn't know about my father. Who was his doctor? Did he have health insurance? What were his health conditions? The ambient beeps and the smell of the antiseptic and body odors made my knees tremble, like the way they used to right before a game, a lump of ice melting in my gut, but without any of that good anticipation. No one else was in the lobby except for one frail woman in a wheelchair who appeared to be asleep. But when I walked by her, her roomy eyes snapped open. She said something. I leaned in, smiled gently. What? I asked. Go to hell, she said. I think I'm already there, I said. <laughs> the receptionist gave me the name of my father's doctor and a number to call, and then handed me my father's personal belongings. You can give them back to your dad, but it's out of our hands if they go missing. We don't take responsibility for lost items, she said. Pa patients lose things. Things disappear. How long is he supposed to stay here, I asked. The doctor will go over all that with you. She handed me a wire basket with his cell phone, keys, and wallet. The wallet was thick and hearty as the sandwiches he'd like to eat, he used to eat. The leather, soft and worn from writing for years in his hip pocket. I thumbed through it. It was an old wallet that he'd probably had for 25 years, the ancient kind with plastic sleeves for photographs. I flipped through them, a time capsule of a family that no longer existed. A snapshot of my mother before she was a mother, a slight young woman, maybe 20 years old, in a short plaid dress, beaming for the camera. My brother, a child of 10 or 11, holding one of the rabbits he used to show at 4-H, his own big rabbit teeth shining, his entire face lit up with joy. And then in the back, a creased, a creased snapshot of me at the age of three, pushing our cat Daisy around in a plastic toy shopping cart and wearing oversized purple sunglasses, Elton John style, and a tie-dyed shirt, a girl I once knew. An aide in, a teddy bear, in teddy bear scrubs pointed out my father's room, which was empty, two beds separated by a thin yellow curtain. Then I followed her down the hallway, past the lounge where a half dozen patients parked in wheelchairs and watched Ellen. Despair crept over me like a thick, oozing gray mud, impossible to shake. The aide led me into another room where my father and several other patients were engaged in various exercises, one raising his arms, another holding a red ball, another squeezing a physical therapist's hand. My father was planted in a wheelchair. Had it not been for his face, more wrinkled and gaunt, but still hardened and intimidating, with that hawk beak of a nose, I may not have recognized him. He looked impossibly feeble and old. His muscles that used to strain against the seams of his shirt had withered away, and now his gaunt shoulders hunched like a question mark under the billows of a red flannel shirt. The plaid slippers were shocking. My father had only ever worn boots, even in the house, like a soldier or a cowboy, except occasionally on summer days when he joined my mother in going barefoot wiggling his pale toes and calling out, fancy free. Seeing him here in this place, like the one where his own father had died, made my throat swell. He was turned away from me as I approached, and the physical therapist, a petite black woman in her early 20s, smiled brightly at me. Duke's getting stronger. He's a fighter, she said, but her eyes were guarded. I wanted to apologize for him for whatever racist slur or offensive thing he'd likely said, but she and my father bumped fists like old teammates. She said she'd see him later and walked over to another patient. Overcome by the strange feeling that I did not know who I was to him, I lightly pressed my hand to his shoulder. He responded slowly to my touch and only slightly turned his head. I came around, so I came around the wheelchair and crouched down, facing him at eye level. Unlike me, my father still had an impressive head of hair, steely gray, combed back in a thick swoop. He glared at me with furious pale blue eyes, the skin around them as pink as baby fingers, translucent. What do you want? His breath smelled bad, like baloney. Dad, it's me, I said. The murmuring of the other patients rose around us, then a high-pitched alarm echoed from down the hall, but nobody seemed to notice or care. A glimmer of calm winked through me, the gummy, maybe. I wished for something stronger. Dad, it's me, I repeated. Nate, your kid. 
He was too weak and infirm to get out of the chair, but he looked at me with contempt and tensed up like a snake about to strike. He wanted to hit me. I drew back. You're not Cash, he said. I'm Nate, I said. I'm your oldest. I would not say my old name for him. I crossed my arms over my flat chest and looked down at him now from where I stood. I don't know, no, Nate, he said. The physical therapist, whose name tag said Kim, noticed something was amiss and came back over. Everything okay? She touched my wrist, her nails painted a cobalt cobalt blue with red gold flakes, and looked at me with kindness. He gets confused sometimes, she said. The doctor will talk to you about that. Then she spoke to my father, her voice louder and slower, like she was addressing a simple-minded child. Now, isn't it nice of your son to visit you? My father glared and said not a word, and I remembered what my, father used to call, what my mother used to call his blue days, which were different than his bad days. On his blue days, he rarely left the bedroom, and if I or my brother tried to talk to him, he would just stare right through us, like we were no more visible than the air. But the air was useful to him, and we were not. You can take him out to the patio. He likes that, Kim said. It's nice out there. Do you want to go with me, Dad, I asked. My father's eyes were as still and threatening as a lizard's. He knew exactly who I was. I'm not going anywhere, he said, with you. Now, Duke, Kim started. It's okay. I took a deep breath and tried to keep my voice steady. I'll see you later, Dad, okay? He licked his thin lips but did not speak. His face quivered with fury, but I saw the sadness too, the years of pain. As I turned to walk through the door, I heard him call out, tell Cash to come get me. Tell my son to take me home. That's it. Thank you. I'm Roberta Schultz, and I'm from Wilder, Kentucky, and this is my third adventure at Heinemann. I have to warn you, this is an emergent introduction. <laughs> What's in a name? R. R. Lyrae is a variable star in the Lyra constellation. As the brightest star in this class, it became the eponym for the R.R. Lyrae class of stars extensively studied by astronomers. These stars, commonly found in globular clusters, are used as standard candles to measure galactic distances, assisting what's known as the cosmic distance ladder. The poet Lyrae Van Cleef Stefanen muses on the interplay between science and poetry, considers how we might edit our poems through movement, like dance, <laughs> practices emergent pedagogy, and delights in poems as vector maps. Like the stars with whom she shares a name, she assists us in measuring galactic distances between our words and their intended meaning. She's worked this exquisite magic so far through helping us to map our words in space from top to bottom, from bottom to top, and on both edges. It is my delight and privilege to welcome a National Book Award finalist, gifted teacher, and stellar poet, Lyra Van Cleef Stefanen, to the stage this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been just such a pleasure to be here um, this week, uh, to be back here with you all. Um, yeah, uh, 
Heinemann, it's really funny. I was talking earlier at dinner about how it's um, it's harder for me to make a thing to hide behind at Heinemann to do a reading because it's a place where I feel very seen and very known. And so it's a really vulnerable space for me to be in. And I say that to say, I appreciate y'all and thank you for that, for making that space. So I don't even know what I'm going to read. I'm going to pull this computer out and hope it works. So you get an emergent reading as well. <laughs> but new work, dead gummit, Carter. Is it coming? books just in case it doesn't want to act right. So, yes, new work from a book that I've been working on that I feel, it feels like I've been working on it for time immemorial. <laughs> oh, gosh. I've been having these great conversations with Carter about that this week because I feel like we've known each other for time immemorial. So, all right, from the beginning. I realized at some point that um, um, my idea of myself as a, as a maker and an artist came from my mother's sewing room. My mother made all my clothes when I was growing up. And so I have a poem called I, but the I is a punctuation mark. It's a colon and an M dash and a colon that looks like a sewing notion from my mom's sewing room. So this is I. Notions have always been material. A flight to Paris, a pattern unfolded from a paper pouch marked facile, a snap to make the delicate sound punctuate an afternoon in mother's sewing room. Press the small square plastic box to trap a pongless in a clear case, then step on a hidden pin, prick snagged in the pink shag. Underfoot, a silver stitch in time wounds, nothing heals. The rift between mother time, mine, on my knees, pinning pattern to paper, punctures the fabric. Orphaned girls spill out, like glass head pins spilled from a case map vectors on Rue des Anglais. The haberdashery, a wife study workshop in 1838. In 1988, mother wields the pounce wheel, chalks tracks, Teeth showing the way a notion's violent. The needle jumps, but a presser foot keeps material flat while feed dogs grip. Yellow seersucker from below where what a wife is is still mechanical. Something held, something pierced, something guiding the process. Something rhythmic, sometimes I feel. Like a motherless child, sometimes I feel the orphaned girls like piecing, a shortage remedied by joining. Such lengths 
a line of women in leg of mutton, gigo sleeves, fabric ballooned over their arms like parachutes, deflating, gone to study, seated and shrinking. Where is she, the black wife, someone seeking to be, if not lingering, where people press themselves, prone over links of silks that saved their lives, pressing the last of the air out, where piecing hides a lack to the untrained, without a notion how, hanger, haberdashery, join themselves in a motherless child, join a motherless child to an age, to ages. This is blooming, and it makes um, mention of my mom, uh, Clementine, and my adoptive uh, grandmother, Faye Witt. Blooming. Try to spell the teeth sucking sound. Sound that shoots the eyes right sidelong toward the edge of a field. Vision branched into full flowering, then drags the eyes back as swift, alert toward witness. The margin, people, leafy here. Don't say community like that. Don't say communion like that. Don't say communist like that. Here, efflorescing like sound that is unspellable. Spit pull and air's edge against the enameled walls inside one's maw. Sound fritz, bites, soothes, sedge. A yellow field breathing space, roots. To breathe is to heal what a body might do in a field with a breath. To frit is to begin to prefuse sand and flux, but push the breath hard enough through, and it is to call the dogs or to call attention to St. John's wort, the sedge in this wild blooming. How bored of dull walls of every sort I am a frustration of flowers, pulled back over the tongue and stopped against the wall behind the teeth, a hiss that is a click, an image shuddered, a story the eyes shot. Someone placed a skull in the middle of a field. I'm stumbling through Commission to still life, this I can't finish until I invent a way of spelling an upside down T, a row of S's sucked backward to a thick tongued stop like someone's snapped. A picture I don't want to describe, the skull, the wall. Let T stand for tool. Let T stand for tag, I'm it. Commit. Let T stand for the work T does in try. Teeth, shoot, frit, witness. Careful, you don't end up in the Chattahoochee, my mother warned me. I am trying here not to open my mouth. Your heart knows where home is, Grandma reminded me. Understand what happens when a sound opens. If by assessment you mean how will I measure when I have sounded the proper spelling, what does it mean to thrive? I miss the gold that glinted in my mama's mouth and the gold that glinted in grandma's mouth. Their sudden smiles, glorious mischief. Women, no kin to one another, for whom witness meant to tell an old, old story. Notice the sedge. 
its structure? What of the work T does in notice? What of the structure? Aaron Kaima, if the work fails, let me had been breathing. Structure, if I fails, I still hold the work T does in delight, theirs. Florida baby girl and Appalachia grandbaby. I am still gleaning in grandma's, that's St. John's wort, gold, and mama's, look at God, glint, a simple gift, a breathless glimpse. This is a poem called They One of a Kind, and I've never read it anywhere. So we'll see how that goes. I've been thinking a lot this week as we work in the classes about um, dissociation as I'm doing all of these exercises in the workshop to pull us down into the body. And so this is one of those poems that's thinking about that in a moment from my, to from my childhood. They one of a kind. My mother called us y'all, as if we were the farthest things from her, as in, y'all don't know nothing about the thing we knew. Nothing about was who we came from. We had not people, neither my mother nor each other. When I say we, I mean the ones I feared were out, meeting the world without me, such that when I ventured out myself, I'd come across strangers who called my name, who seemed to know me well enough to find my blank stare strange till I feigned recognition. It frightened me. Who had they met? Had I pretended not to know? Y'all, I've been knowing my whole life. I've been more than baby girl lets on. Mama meant some other family, right? But I came to once, sat bolt upright in my bed. A stranger stared at me until I saw my mother backing frightened out the door. This is In the Noise and Whip. And it has an epigraph from Gwendolyn Brooks who writes, it is lonesome, yes, for we are the last of the loud. Nevertheless, live, conduct your blooming in the noise and whip of the whirlwind. The whirlwind forms ahead, approaches flittingly as a butterfly might, as if it would alight upon my sister and me, strengthens, becomes visible, picking up debris, waves its hubris like a flag, would whisk us as the country is now whisked, except for our mothers bind you prayers over us, their peace be still and tisk and their peace be still tisk and tell storm that harmonized knocks weather down, keeps us weighted against dry conversion to bland husks of death. Not only can I cry, I cry. I have a gift for life, my only gift. How young I learned. To live nevertheless requires an elegance I put on like a woolen stole, then sheepishly dropped my head as I walked in it, somehow ashamed. How soon I learn, how late. Break the line the way that you would break. Have broken, 
with those who taught you you would still run. Break the narrative. A body is a story. A severed snake's head in the sassafras. And break down tears, a, a fluid space from which we might reassemble flight. Eclipse. Oh, when the moon goes down in blood. A period is a pebble, a rock that blocks a ray, a raise my heart, a beat beat in my ears, a chorus thud of marching boots, a crunch from which my eyes flee, blaze, the gaze lifts, then ellipses, a wobbling slip toward Strabismus, cloisters, the cellulars locatable may, alas, the signal scrambled. These devices, Idolin, where am I? In a book, in the bath, in a claw foot tub, claw hammering, a past moment in a current set, afloat on the edge of insight, of an uncooperative vision, a black body wrapped in a white towel, anxious to reveal, then abandon. In unison, can you tell me how to get back to the sentence so I can serve it? There, a period is an embolus, a ticking clock, a ticking clock, a bumba clot, a green fuzz tennis ball struck with such force, who almost sees stars? Who's almost lost from whose lack of listening, girl? Adrift on an ocean, not always the Atlantic, easing the mind of a woman looking toward a child across the way. No one is white here. Only the towel is white. Lay it on the sand, lie down, and relax. I would end here except the periods full of blood. The towels soaked, the sand, the stone, the whole sea been gone red. All right, how is the time? I forgot to bring a watch up here. <laughs> All right. Well, I um I wound up in the in the neuro unit of the ICU um, a couple of years back. Um, I had a headache that lasted for five days. I went into the hospital. They said um, we think we see an aneurysm on your ophthalmic artery. And they sent me over to a hospital with a neuro specialty. And then they said, we think we see an aneurysm on your carotid artery. And so I wound up in there for five days with them doing the stroke protocol. And this poem comes out of that. When there's nothing in it, a moment's vocabulary bleeds into the week that follows, bleeds under What's missing here? Leave. Leave the house empty, unraked leaves as evidence. A metallic warmth with which the season suffused suffers, begs a series of questions. The first, a bulge in the carotid. What procedures are performed in the space where weakness shapes your life? There. Take that, the neurosurgeon, taken with his view, instructs from beyond a versed veil, leaving you unconvinced of your own presence. Baby, can you open your eyes? Reduced to soreness at the crook of your thigh, you've slipped yourself, snatched from soul slot. You're where, oh my God, where 
Are you hiding now? You've searched, been searched in contrast, that seared, split sight. Beautiful fugitive, you'll never find the bleed. So maybe I'll just read two more. This is Miss Ann. We grew up, um, I grew up with my mother with this slur in my house that my mother used to use all of the time and thinking about the way that a word can make things appear before you. I wrote this puzzle. Miss Anne flies from my mother's mouth an apparition. What does it mean? What's in apparition? A name when you say I, Miss Anne, you mistake me for an apparition. I cannot anger her, see her in her apparition, human form, some teacher, some stranger. What does acquitted mean but apparition? My mother could not bear it, the thought of having arranged for her apparition. Arrangements, but where's the music for this? This ghost, nothing, an apparition. A bitch pissing in every corner of my house, claw hammer and apparition. Now ask your mammy, now it's gonna get nasty. Breaking up Christmas with apparitions. Vanilla sandwich cookies on a pretty plate. A real dulcimer, an apparition soaked in swamp water, soaked in mud, a backlog burning your apparitions. For your white girlfriends, it's all relative. These are my relatives, apparitions. This is my relative self, more or less. Miss Anne, you can't tell me she's an apparition. You mean to tell me you can't tell the difference? Here I am, double or nothing, this apparition. This is On Silence. The heat bugs rev, a sound like a struggling stutter of a pull start mower, sound stripped to tenoral, abandoning, exhausted cuticle to August sun, disembodied sound, heat bugs, zzz, zzz, as though an abstraction of sleep were to try to rouse itself to fill the hot daylight. Heat bugs, my sister says, in that tone she gets of authority. I know sometimes she likes to lie. I don't hardly believe a word anyone says to me, but listen now for what they are trying to convey. A chip on my shoulder, I understood post-truth before the world soaked itself in it. True story, once she and I drove through a forming tornado to get to crack a barrel. <laughs> that is true. The heat bugs sing, zzz, zzz. If that emerging storm had come together above the car, we would have filled it with the doxology. Her high mountain perfect pitch and my low flat Florida Pentecostal alto all up in the swirl. Like the way we say to each other, I'm circling the drain on the phone when we're feeling bad. Except the opposite, a lifting off instead. As though we were the mist lifting off the pond when we fish with dad at 5 a.m. to beat the heat and we overcast and snag ourselves in the trees, and we throw back the joke-worthy bass, and we bask 
at how he grouses after the bypass about the boat, the way it turns in the water the second he takes his hand off the throttle. Thank y'all. We have a few announcements we want to make um, about some upcoming activities. Uh, one, um, I would ask Marianne to come up, if she will, um, and tell us about that. Uh, the readings exhausted me. I'm spent, aren't you all? But thank you all very much. So the Hunman Settlement School will sponsor a book discussion that um, is part of the Kentucky Humanities Council's Kentucky Reads Project. And this year we're reading Dear Anne, the latest novel by Bobby Ann Mason, the Kentucky writer. So last year we did this. Um, we read Crystal Wilkinson's novel, The Birds of Opulence. So this year we're reading Bobby Ann Mason. And so... The sponsoring organization, which is the Settlement School, gets 15 copies of the novel and for free. Um, so Josh will probably have the details on how you can get a copy of the novel if you want to join us. But please don't request a copy of the novel and then not come to the discussion, okay? Like, play fair, all right? Um, so, Bobby, has anybody read Bobby Ann Mason's novel? Okay, good, a couple of you have. So it's about this young woman who leaves Western Kentucky, a dairy farm, um, to go to school in, um, in uh, California. Um, but really, and this is a little bit complicated, she's on a cruise at the end of her life with her dying husband, and she's actually imagining what if as a young woman, I had gone to school in California rather than in the Northeast. And so that's kind of the gist of the, of the novel. So it's going to be on August, September 1st. It'll be virtual. Um, and so we invite you to come. Um, please do and participate. Um, it's a lot of fun. Jane Moore Waldrop is also one of the Kentucky Humanities Council um, book discussion leaders, and she's led some discussions, too, for this program. So I hope you'll join us for that. And Josh will probably maybe, I don't know, email announcements about how to get books or something like that. Okay, thank you. I hope you'll do it. Please, uh, please join us for that. Um, there may be also be other discussions happening near where you are. They're happening all across the state. Some have already happened. So you can go online to uh, the Humanities Council and check that out. In terms of the settlement schools, you can go to our, to our website, hyman.org, click events. You'll see the Dear Ann discussion. The details are there to register for the virtual discussion. It's free to register for. You may already have a copy of the book. You may want to, um, it gives you details about how to request one of the free copies um, that we have. If you have means to purchase a copy as well, there are some in the, maybe one left in the back at the bookstore. If you have them already, by all means. Uh, but we had around 40 or 50 last year. Maybe I don't know how many people came to the book discussion because not everybody plays fair. But um, I think we gave out about 50 copies of the book last year. But um, so please check that out and join us for that with, with, with Murdy. We would love to have you. The other th um, announcement for an event is we do have our fall riders retreat uh, scheduled for this fall. The details are on our website as well for November 18th, the 20th. Um, the facilitator is in the room. Would she stand? Yes. <laughs> So, yeah, so Annette will be joining us here 
Well, she's wel- you're welcome. I didn't tell her that I was going to say this in advance. I'm sure she doesn't have a speech prepared. But um, but Annette uh, will be facilitating this fall's Riders Retreat, which is like a reschedule from the one that was supposed to be in spring 2020 that um, never happened. So uh, we're excited to have Annette with us this fall, November 18th to the 20th. Those are pretty small. We limit those to around 15. It's kind of the cap of folks that, that can come to a, to a retreat. Um, but all the details and registration information is online as well. So that is, is there anything else I'm supposed to announce before we talk trivia? I think we're, that's it. Okay, well, thank you all so much. I will let Melissa um, come up and just give any vague details. I, know, I hope everyone stays in here that wants to participate, that everyone will participate, but um, we'll let some announcements.